Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. My name is Mark Williams, and I am your host, and we are so excited to be with you for another Sunday night and another amazing Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. We've got some amazing speakers that are, I get to introduce to you in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, if you haven't yet, please go download the Our Turtle House Digital app. It's totally free. You can go to turtle.link slash app. It looks just like this, the, the picture that you see on the screen. And like I said, it's totally free. You get access to all the firesides that we've done this year. There's a brand new podcast from Carmen Herbert called Doing Good, where she talks with people who are doing good in their own way. And it's so uplifting. And, and you can also upgrade and get some additional content from some of your favorite speakers like John, by the way, Hank Smith, Meg Johnson, and, and so many more. So please go to our turtle house dot com or to turtle dot link slash app and download the free our turtle house app today we love hearing from you about the firesides as well you give us ideas of things to talk about and speakers to have so let's let's talk look at some of the feedback that we've gotten this last week first from asher connor and mckenzie they said we love all the firesides each, each sunday they uplift us and fill our house with laughter and the peace of the spirit Thank you. Thanks for all the inspiration you bring us each week. Asher, Connor, and Mackenzie, thank you so much for writing in. And we're so glad that you love these firesides. We love putting them together for you. We also have a note from Isaac who said, thank you, thank you, thank you. These have been life-changing and so has the Our Turtle House app. Thank you for all that help and work so hard to provide these. Thank you so much, Isaac. We're so grateful for your feedback and we love putting together these firesides and, and working on the Our Turtle House app. We're just, we love the gospel, we love the spirit and are so gr grateful that you're finding value in it as well. Now, tonight's fireside topic again has come from one of you and this is from Anna Lee. And our, our topic tonight is becoming Christ-like, such an important topic. And so I'm excited to introduce our speakers tonight who are gonna help us hit it home and talk about what it means and how we can become more Christ-like. So our first speaker, our first speaker grew up in Provo, Utah. He served a Spanish speaking mission to San Bernardino, California. And soon after he met and married the former Stephanie Gillespie, he says, when Steph married me, it was the kindest thing anyone's ever done for me. He and Stephanie have had six children and they recently became grandparents to three granddaughters. He graduated from BYU with a degree in zoology so he could one day work at a zoo or teach seminary, which is kind of the same thing, right? He's been a professional teacher for over 25 years, part of which his work directly at the church office building where he was responsible for the movies and media that you've seen as part of seminary and institute. He has a passion for the scriptures and currently teaches at the Utah Valley Institute of Religion at UVU. And he re recently was released as a stake president where he served for nine years. And he says it was the privilege to have a front row seat for a while. He got to see just how much the Lord cares for us and interacts in the daily details of our lives. Let's welcome Andy Horton. Andy, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. Good evening. Great to be with you, uh, Mark. Hey. Glad to be here. Uh, so glad you're with us. Thank you so much. I'm excited to, to hear... Hear from the front lines what, it, uh, what your thoughts are on becoming Christ-like. So thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker grew up in Potomac, Maryland. She received her bachelor's degree in communication studies from Brigham Young University in 1994. She's the uh, co-founder of Endo What, a bipartisan movement dedicated to educating and empowering people with endometriosis. Through her work with the Marriott Daughters Foundation, she's dedicated to elevating communities through educational, human services, and health initiatives. And in 2019, Mary Alice founded the What Now podcast, which respectfully addresses the stigma that surrounds <clears throat> certain cultural nor norms in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She loves pickleball. She's a temple worker and a mother of two, and she's cr committed to creating positive change. Let's welcome Mary Alice. Mary Alice, how are you doing? I am great. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm happy to be here. Now, that's a nice view that you, well, it's, it's, uh, those pictures behind you, that's a nice view. Is that uh, is that what you're looking at? <laughs> that is the view across the street from my house, yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I moved to the so celestial jealous. kingdom on earth. Oh, it's starting to get cold here in Utah, and that, that view is looking better and better every day. <laughs> <laughs> Come visit. Oh, thank you so much, Mary Alice. Thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. Thank you. We'll introduce our final speaker. 
Our final speaker travels as many as 300,000 miles per year, inspiring, motivating, and moving audiences around the world <clears throat> to create experiences that touch hearts for a lifetime. He's one of the youngest people ever to receive the Council of Peers Award for Excellence and to be inducted into the prestigious National Speakers Hall of Fame. In 2001, at the age of 27, his life changed in an instant with a, when a 2,000-pound bale of hay shattered his neck, leaving him a quadriplegic. But his dreams were not paralyzed that day, and he became an example of what is possible. He's a best-selling author, a pr the president of his own communications company, and he's, rec he's a recognized world-class world wheelchair athlete. In 2003, he set a world record by wheeling his chair from Salt Lake City to Las Vegas. That's 513 miles. He's also a member of the Elite Speakers Roundtable, which is one of 20 people, 20 of the world's top speakers. Welcome. Let's welcome Chad Hymas. Chad, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's a joy to be here. Oh, you bet. Just a quick question for you, Chad. Like, that's amazing. Well, not question, but that's amazing that you wheeled all the way from Salt Lake to Vegas. That's, that's just yeah, that, that's so yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I prefer we don't talk about that. That's uh, one of the dumbest things I've ever done in my life. So we can, <laughs> we can quickly, we can end that conversation right now. We can <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you all so much for being here with us and, and for being willing to share your thoughts about what it means to become Christ-like. Let's go ahead and get things started off. And so Mary Alice is going to offer us an opening prayer. Mary Alice. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be gathered together uh, for this opportunity to speak of this live fireside. And we ask for the spirit to be with our speakers and that we can all draw closer to Christ and become more Christ-like through this experience and this opportunity. And we are thankful for that. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, we'll go ahead and have our second and third speakers go backstage for just a few minutes, and I'll I'll chat with our first speaker, which is Andy. Andy, so you were a steak president for nine years. Was that a family steak or a YSA steak? Or it was a family steak. Yeah, and oh, I did wow. not see that calling coming. I had not served as a bishop, so. Oh wow, <laughs> it's that's a whole nother story. But uh, the morning oh, I was my called, pranked my wife with a phone call that made it look like I was being called. And then two minutes after the prank ended, I really got the phone call. And my wife looked at me and said, oh, not so funny now, is it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's it's almost like Heavenly Father knows. He's like, okay, you pranked your wife. Now I'm going to prank you, except this is for real. <laughs> I think that's exactly what he was thinking. <laughs> I love it. What, what an amazing experience for nine years to serve the people of your stake in that capacity. And to to, like you said in that quote, you know, just to see – on the front lines, you know, how, how in, intimately involved he is in the details of our lives. Yeah, it was pretty amazing to see someone who had never had priesthood leadership experience, how I could help others who had had lots of experience just through revelation, just putting myself in the moment and, and trying to be prepared to receive those revelations. And it was amazing. It, it was, it really is a a war zone out there, and I see God's hand in making lives better all the time. It was great. I love that, and then not to mention with you know the, your work at the at the seminaries and institutes and everything at, at uh, yeah the institute at UVU. So you've got a lot of experience, a lot of perspective, and I'm I, and I'm excited to hear what you have to share. Go ahead and take it away, my friend. All right, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Wow, it's great to be with you all this evening. I. Uh, I crave moments to be able to teach, and uh, as you know, COVID has made that interesting, if that's uh, part of your career. Uh, I This past summer was the first time in about 20 years that I wasn't a part of EFY uh, directing or teaching, and I really miss being with those thousands of youth every summer. And uh, But this is a way through technology, like we're doing tonight, that we can we can still try and do our little part to try and bless lives. So it's a privilege, a real privilege to be here. I want to talk a little bit this morning. Uh, let, let me introduce my family, if I could. Um, my wife and I, Stephanie, we were, uh, well, wow, we're approaching uh, almost 30 years of marriage, to be honest. But this is our little family. And I want to kind of take you back a few years and tell you what, what started all this. Uh, I served a mission in California. Um, and 
when I got home from my mission, uh, I I dated here and there, and that's a whole new experience because for for years, two years, you're told you can't look at girls and and talk to girls the same way. You can't smell girls. You can't nothing to do with girls for two years. And so when I came home, I started to date a little here and there. I went I went out with Stephanie for the first time about after I was home three weeks and loved her from the moment I met her. Didn't know I'd marry her, but I, I really was impressed with her. A few weeks after that, I got set up on a blind date. And uh, this blind date was very interesting. We, And it was a single date, which can be frightening to go on a single date with someone you've never been with, never met before. So we uh, went and picked her up for dinner. And as we were driving along, just this little incident occurred. She pulled, she reached into her bag and she pulled out a piece of gum and put the gum in her mouth and she crinkled up the wrapper and she rolled down the window and she flicked the wrapper out the window. And I remember thinking, dang, I've got a, I've got a litter bug in my car and, and I have this thing. It's my thing, litter, littering. I don't, I don't think it's good to litter. It's a tiny thing, but it was a big thing in the moment. And I thought, all right, well, I got my weaknesses too, obviously. Uh, so we're driving along and we uh, then come to a stoplight that was red. So I stopped because that's what you do at red stoplights. And as we're sitting there waiting for the light to go green, the radio is playing. And uh, I noticed this young man starts to cross the, the street and he has... He has permanent crutches, the kind with the, the armband, and then you hold those handles. And he was slowly making his way across the street. And he got about halfway across, and the light went green. And, of course, you know, no cars went for obvious reasons. But I noticed as we sat there chatting that this young lady started to direct her comments kind of at him and started to say unkind things about how long it was taking him and we'll never make it anywhere tonight. And uh, I didn't like how it, how it came across. And so now I've got a litter bug and a people maker funner of her in my car, which um, anyway, the, the light went green eventually. He made it across the street and we continued on our date. And I, I saw lots of great things in this young lady as well. But those two little incidents kind of hovered over me like a little, a little cloud, and I, um, I dropped her off that night. And uh, about a month later, I am on a date with this young lady that would become my wife one day. Now we, we were in the car driving to dinner, believe it or not, and we came to a stop sign, which was also red, um, ironically. And so I stopped and. Believe it or not, and I wondered if there was cameras posted somewhere because I see a different young man, but a young man with some sort of disability in his legs, and he's got crutches, and he's making his way across the, the street in the crosswalk. And that previous date came back in my mind. And he made it halfway, and then three-fourths of the way, and then made it across the street, and we took off. Well... Thought nothing more of it. And we're listening to the radio and some small talk, but I noticed it got quiet for a minute with Stephanie. And and then I suddenly I hear her sniffle a little bit. And I remember thinking to myself, self, what did I is she crying? What did I say? What did I what did I do? Maybe she doesn't want to eat at Arby's. It's gotta be it. It's gotta be Arby's. And finally, I said what they teach us to say at boy training, and that is simply, what's wrong? And she said what they teach girls to say in girls training, and that's nothing. And <laughs> I could tell something was wrong because the tears and the emotions. And so we, we kept driving, and I kept hearing these sniffles. And so I took it to the next level. I said exactly what they teach us at, at boy training. Uh, no, really, what's wrong? And she said, without even referring to notes, nothing, comma, I'm fine. She didn't say the comma, by the way. But she said verbatim, nothing, I'm fine. 
And when I ask youth, when I travel and I speak and I ask them, what do you think her second answer was? They always, all the girls in the room say, nothing, I'm fine, as if they've been trained. Well, I had reached a point where, look, I feel bad. If I did something, I got to figure out what it is. And gosh, we could we could go to McDonald's if you want. Or So I, I do something that normally they tell us and they warn us not to do. I pulled the car over into the shade and I turned the car off. And I turned the radio off and it was quiet. And I said to her, this is third level, okay? Because I'm asking her what's wrong. And the danger here is if I ask her and this, and this girl starts to unload, I have no training to handle what might come out of her mouth. No training. But I went out of faith and I said simply to her, of course, referring to my notes, look, we're not going to go any further until you tell me what's wrong. I said that. Uh, I don't know if it was brave or stupid, but I said it. And then silence for probably two minutes, maybe one minute. And all you could, you, you couldn't hear, you could hear the shade. That's about all you could hear. And finally, this is what she says. It's not fair that that boy and I'm thinking, what boy? Did I run over a boy? What boy? And then it hit me, wait, is she talking about the stop sign? And then she finishes, it's not fair that that boy has to have legs that don't work quite right. And she got a little bit emotional. And I remember thinking, wait, she doesn't even know that boy. And then she went on and she says, he can have my legs. And it was so sincere. Now, in the moment, I didn't think of the scripture, but the scripture comes to mind. It's in Mosiah 18 and verses 8 and 9. And it's, if you're familiar with your baptismal covenants, then you know what I'm talking about. Verse 8 simply runs through some of the, you know, it introduces us to baptism and there's four or five covenants we make that are pretty serious. And one of them is being willing to bear one another's burdens. And then you see willing to mourn with those that mourn and comfort those that stand in need of comfort and stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and all places, even on dates, even with people we don't know. And no, I didn't think of that when this happened, but what I do remember thinking was I can't remember or I can't, believe how selfless this comment is, how she's talking about this young man who she's never met before. And it impressed me, and this light went on and said, this, this is a girl that you want to get to know better because she could take you places. She could help, help me become a better person, more Christ-like. And um, it, it was so such a moment of charity that I was witnessing. Well, about a year, a little more than a year went by, and we had continued to date. And uh, I, I, <laughs> this is a different story for another time, but I proposed to her on April Fool's Day as a joke that she initiated to get some other people. But then I tweaked it so that I proposed to her and then said April Fool's. So it other than getting hit by my future mother-in-law in the arm, it, it went fairly well. But um, three months later, we went to a little Chinese restaurant and there were a dozen roses on the table. And we were actually on our way to a wedding reception later that night. Well, <clears throat> as we finished our meal, the lady brought out, I had come to the point where I decided I wanted to marry this girl. And after we ate, the server brought out our little plate with the fortune cookies. And Stephanie grabbed a fortune cookie and it said, uh, she cracked it open and pulled out a little paper. And it said, Stephanie, I love you. Will you marry me? And first of all, what are the odds that a fortune cookie would say that? And so I ran with it. So I thought this was, this was meant to be. So uh, she's staring at that and she says, uh, Andy, what are you doing? And what I was doing was trying to get a ring box out of my sock that I'd stuffed down my sock 
um, at the bottom of my pant leg. And I finally got it out and I, I popped it open. And she's staring at that ring. She goes, oh. <laughs> and suddenly she forgot about the fortune cookie because there's a ring involved. And she took the ring out and put it on her finger. And, and I had to actually get her attention because she was kind of, you know, enamored by the ring. And I said, well, and she didn't answer me right off. She said, well, I think we probably should go talk about this. And I'm thinking, talk about this. Just say yes. And let's kiss for a minute. Let's kiss. Just say yes. And that's not how it played out. We paid for the dinner and we went out and we got in the car to drive, just to go for a drive and visit. I decided we'd go back to my parents' house because I knew that no one was there at the time and we could have a nice conversation there. And the air conditioner in the car for some reason wouldn't work. Oddly, it always works, but it would not turn on. So I'm just sweating up a storm. Um, and all the way there, I'm trying to convince her. Well, I thought, I thought we were in love. I thought, I thought we talked about this. I, in fact, I said, I already called the Salt Lake Temple. It's November 18th at 9.30 in the morning, <laughs> ceiling room three. And uh, in fact, she was about the only person that didn't know that we were going to get engaged that day. We pull into my parents' driveway. And she just, by the way, just kind of chuckled at these comments I'm making. But she never really responded. We walk into my parents' house. She goes downstairs into the basement and um, goes into the bathroom and shuts the door. And now I'm all by myself, sitting on the couch wondering, what did I do wrong here? Of course, I think back to Arby's. And about, she was in there forever. It was probably at least four minutes. That's a long time when you're by yourself and you pop this big question. And then she comes out and she's been, she's been crying. And I want you to know I'm not over-dramatizing this. She was crying and she came up and she took my hand. And she stood in front of me at first. And then she said, so I had a talk with my Heavenly Father. And my, when she's that part of the sentence, I remember thinking, that's it? You wanted to pray? And then she said, I had a talk with my Heavenly Father and he says that I can marry you. And uh, it touched my heart. She sat down and she kissed me. And th that was, we should pause just for a minute and remember that kiss because that was a kiss. And we were engaged. Now, why do I tell you all this? Well, you might recall a scripture in 2 Nephi 32, 8 and 9. And in those verses, you can see where uh, the Lord is encouraging us to pray. In fact, he says we shouldn't perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place we should pray unto the Father in the name of Christ. And I love this sentence, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. You can replace performance with just about any verb going on in your life, anything you're doing. What was I doing? I was proposing to the girl of my dreams. And so in my mind, if I read that now, it says that he will consecrate thy marriage unto thee, that thy marriage may be for the welfare of thy soul. It works for movies you watch. It works for music you listen to, friends you make. And in that moment, it was to become engaged. So as I've thought back over this for the last almost 30 years, I've thought, every time I consider this experience I had getting engaged to her and how she just wanted a minute with her Heavenly Father. She just wanted the chance to connect with Him and make sure she was making the right choice. Her little efforts over her life, scripture study, prayer, her, her charitable attitude towards other people, um, her little efforts to become Christ-like had taught her how to become um, Christ-like in every aspect of her life. And it played a key role in us coming together for eternity. 
Um, I really believe that the more time we spend with Christ, the more time we spend with him. Um, in fact, I intentionally wrote the sentence like this. We need to learn to spend time with Christ like our future depends on it. And so as you feel Satan whispering, you're too tired to read your scriptures, you're too tired to pray, I'm too tired to do, come follow me with your family. Remember, it is those little moments of becoming Christ-like that builds into important moments that impact our future greatly. As you can see, I saw patterns in her life, and I continue to see patterns. Um, this girl doesn't go to bed at night without looking at her scriptures, without, without reading in the Book of Mormon, for sure. And she's an example to me. Um, she's not... She's not a superhero. She doesn't wear a cape. She is a regular, fantastic person like you are. But she has made the time in her life to put the Savior first. And so I really believe that as we do those little things and spend more time with Christ, like our life depends on it, our life will improve. And I am grateful to have her in my life now. Um, can't believe we have six children and three grandchildren, but I really attribute that to, um, at least partially, to her efforts in living a Christ-like life. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love that so much. Just how it's just the little things and spending time with Christ that that bring us closer to Him. But I've got to say that that four minutes had to have felt like a lifetime. <laughs> The worst forever. Ever. <laughs> you remember, remember the movie Sandlot? And he says, forever. forever. Remember that? <laughs> that right, right there. I was <laughs> dying when you were telling that. I was just like, oh, I, I can just appreciate the pain you must have been feeling right there. <laughs> I love your confidence with the proposal. You had a temple date and everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, I like the part where you said, let's just kiss, because I think kissing solves everything. I mean, <laughs> let's, that that. Let's, just, let's just kiss. Let's just kiss. For a minute, right? Yeah. Oh, you didn't say for a minute. I, yeah, I didn't picture that. That's that's great. <laughs> yeah. oh, I love that's it. awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts and your testimony about becoming Christ-like, and, and that personal story just really hit home. So thank you so much. Really Really appreciate your time and uh, sharing your thoughts, Andy. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. We'll Thanks go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker comes, like I said earlier, all the way from Potomac, Maryland, but now lives in San Clemente, California. And I just have, I just have to say again, I'm so jealous about the weather that you get to have. Mary Alice, this is oh, just it's beautiful. It's just not fair. <laughs> hey, I endured 17 winters in Boston, Massachusetts. I deserve this. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I appreciate now. that. Okay. Now the big the big question is how far away, away are you from the beach? Across the street. Oh my goodness. My oh, view my goodness. is right right here. <laughs> uh, that that really is the view. That really is the That's view. my view across the street. Oh, yeah. my goodness. So I grew up in Northern California in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, but we were we were a good hour away from the beach, and so we didn't get get to go as often. And I just I always I always love the beach and the water. So you're you're living the dream right there. I love it. That's so awesome. we are blessed. We are I thank the Lord every day for dropping me here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'm excited to hear about your perspective and on becoming Christ-like. So go ahead and take it away, Mary Alice. Okay. So I'll just start by introducing you to my family. I have a much smaller family. We have two children. Um, and this is a really happy moment in this picture. My daughter was sealed in the San Diego temple on Friday after having her sealing canceled three times because of COVID. <laughs> and she actually was civilly married in our backyard in March. So this was a really culminating event for us on Friday. And on the far left is my husband, Jess and my new son-in-law, Adam and White, my beautiful daughter, Emily, and then my son, Trevin, next to me. So we were very happy to celebrate this moment. <laughs> it was a long time coming. Okay, so I will just jump in. Uh, so I have a little bit more structured comments. And when I was thinking about becoming Christ, like when they asked me to talk about that, 
I was really thinking about those words, what they mean, becoming, what does becoming mean? And to become anything takes work. There is a process involved. If you wanna become a professional tennis player, it takes hours of training and focus and discipline. If you wanna be a great student, it takes a lot of studying and going to class and reading your books. So to become something, you have to have a vision for what you want to become. And it has to be intentional. You have to have an action plan. And the Lord wants us to do that. He wants us to be intentional in how we approach things. And to become like someone else, you have to understand their behaviors, their personality, their aspirations, and their goals. You know, if you want to be like your neighbor, Susie, you have to understand who Susie is. You have to understand what she likes and what her interests are. And to become like Christ, we need to know what he was like and what his mission was and to study his life. And we have so many incredible resources now with the day and age that we live in. We have scriptures, of course, which are the most important resource, which define his life in such a significant way. We have books, we have podcasts, we have videos on I, uh, YouTube, which are incredible, the Come Follow Me videos, the things our Turtle House is putting out, and there is a wealth of information online. There's an incredible TV show called The Chosen that's out now that goes through and depicts Christ's life in such a beautiful, relatable way. So we have these incredible resources that we can use. So I'm going to just talk about five attributes of Jesus Christ that really have stood out to me charity and love. So we have these opportunities to serve all around us. We just need to be looking for them. And Sister Craig in the recent conference, she touched on this, how she decided to put her cell phone away and really engage when she was waiting in lines instead of you know, answering emails and kind of being in her phone. And I love the story that she shared about how she had this opportunity to talk to the man in front of her and they got to talking and pretty soon, He's disclosing that it's his birthday and he hadn't told anyone yet. And she was able to, you know, kind of celebrate that with him in line and just to actually see him, to see him and to communicate with him and to be with him. And we do have opportunities like that every day. And in our culture, it's a distracted culture. We have so much going on and we're all so busy and it's so easy to be distracted. But, you know, Christ really focused on the one and he took time for the one. And when we do that in our individual lives, we can have experiences like Sister Craig had all the time. So let's talk about knowledge. So spiritual and secular knowledge, they will go with us beyond the veil. And our leaders are constantly asking us to seek knowledge out of good books, to seek learning, to seek intellect, because it is one of the great things that we can take with us. Patience, be patient in your trials and turn it over to the Lord. It allows us the opportunity when we have patience to exercise our faith. And we will have situations that come into our lives that test our patience. And I have learned to stop praying for patience because <laughs> every time I pray for patience, I get an intense trial that really tests my patience. But it's interesting because when we start seeking after these attributes like patience and charity and love, they naturally involve and we become better at the other attributes. When you're forced to be patient, when you're forced to endure a trial, you have humility. You have an increase of love and compassion for other people. You have the opportunity to become more obedient so you can get the miracle, so you can get the help that you need. So it's interesting how when you acquire an attribute or two, others start coming naturally because of our commitment to that attribute we're working on. Humility. Humility is not a weakness, but it is a spiritual power. And humble people are more respected. I know the work that I've done in different organizations and with different foundations, the people that I work with who are humble are more respected. People listen to them. They want to work for them. They want to execute whatever the goal is because they have such a humble manner about them that makes people want to listen to them. And Christ was the ultimate example of humility. When he was performing his miracles, he didn't brag or boast about his divinity. He wanted to do it for the benefit of the person that was sitting in front of him. And he 
I love what we've been talking about recently in Come Follow Me, how when he was speaking to the 2,500 people, how he had the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with each of those children, to bless each of those children. It was important to him. He was humble and he was able to connect one-on-one -on -one with those people. And I love that. Obedience, listening and acting on promptings and obeying God's commandments allows us to strengthen our faith and to help other people. And I had a unique experience when I lived in Boston um, with a mother of five. And I was out to dinner with a friend and I was coming home and I was sitting in my driveway. And I normally don't just kind of sit in my driveway because it's so cold in Boston in the winter. I just go in my garage, shut the door and go inside. But on this particular Saturday evening, I was sitting in my car and I had this intense prompting about this woman in our ward and that she was in danger and that she needed my help. And I just kind of sat with that for a minute because I didn't know her and I was kind of uncomfortable reaching out to her. And, but the prompting kept coming to me all night. And the next day on Sunday, I walked into the foyer and I ended up seeing her down the hallway and she was leaning against the wall and she had just dropped her child off at the nursery. And I got that same prompting, you have to go talk to her right now. And I kept kind of resisting it from my own fear of, I don't know this person and this is really awkward. And what if nothing's wrong in her life? And I say this and it's really weird. And, um, but I just kind of took the opportunity to follow the prompting and to walk down the hallway. And I leaned against the wall next to her and I just said, I just keep getting this prompting that you're in danger. Are you okay? And she disclosed to me a very disturbing situation where her husband had been abusing her and her children and that it had become so bad she was considering taking her life to escape the situation because she has tried so many times to leave but she couldn't afford it financially and she couldn't take care of her kids if she had left and so she was thinking of taking her life and in that moment i caught her on a day she was considering that opportunity for her life and that was a very important reminder to me that Christ is aware of us, that he will send people to help us in our moment of need, and that we as members of the church and disciples of Christ have opportunities to save people. This is a dramatic instance, but we do have opportunities to be that angel on earth for people if we're willing to be obedient to the promptings that he gives us. So uh, charity and love. Jesus Christ he sees people deeply. He sees individuals, their needs, and who they can become. And even in our busy lives, we can follow the example of Jesus and see individuals, their needs, their faith, their struggle, and who they can become. And that was from Michelle Craig in the recent conference. And that is so true. Jesus sees people deeply. He doesn't just look at them and see them like we do most of the time. He sees them deeply. And I love that word, deeply. So knowledge, there are so many different things that we can look to for knowledge. There are so many great books and the scriptures and BYU Pathway is an incredible resource for knowledge for anyone in the church. I mean, you can be in a third world, third world country with dirt floors and get a BYU Pathway education. It is incredible what they're doing. It is so affordable. You can go on YouTube and listen to inspiring videos and educate yourself on the Come Follow Me. And just anything you want to learn about Christ is there. Podcasts, there's great content that can draw us closer to Christ. And we want to use these books and we want to use these platforms appropriately. We want to use them productively. We want to use them to draw closer to Christ and become more like Christ. And it can really increase our faith and knowledge of Christ exponentially. Okay, and patience. So I'm going to share a personal experience I've had with this um, in a significant way. So I have this beautiful daughter in the middle, Emily. And when she was 13, she started experiencing chronic debilitating pain to the point where she was missing months of school. She couldn't walk down the street. She couldn't interact with friends because she was having pain attacks constantly. 
And it, and it was really scary as a parent. And I remember going to Mayo Clinic and taking her to Mass General and Children's Hospital of Boston and some of the best medical facilities in the country to see what was happening with her. And no one knew what was wrong with her. And months became years. And it wasn't just a year, it was six years of chronic pain. And I remember um, turning to the Lord and, and deciding I was gonna go to the temple every week. And um, I was blessed to have a temple in Boston, 20 minutes from our house. And I made this commitment that I was going to go every single week. And it didn't lift the burden at that time, but it did give me patience in that trial. And I don't think I could have endured it as well unless I was going to the house of the Lord and speaking with him and being with him in the celestial room. And it got to a point where my patience was tried so significantly, and I needed the suffering to end for her. And I turned to the Lord, and I surrendered my child to the Lord. And that was a very humbling experience. And after six years and three surgeries, she had a turning point surgery that gave her her life back. And that was a trial of patience for me. And it taught me to rely on higher power. And the, the good thing about these things that try our patience is it teaches us humility. It teaches us love. It allows us to be more empathetic and it allows us to build on the attributes of Christ and to become more like him. And I learned that right when you feel like you are going to get broken from a trial is sometimes when the miracle happens. And I was blessed to have that experience. Humility. So being humble means recognizing that we are not on earth to see how important we become. That's of the world, but to see how much difference we can make in the lives of others. And that is of Christ. And when we're humble, he will allow us these opportunities to help and serve others. Patience. Oh, obedience. So each time we have faith to be obedient to God's laws. I love this quote from President Russell Nelson this last talk. Each time we have the faith to be obedient to God's laws, even when popular opinions belittle us, or each time we resist entertainment or ideologies that celebrate covenant breaking, we are exercising our faith, which in turn increases our faith. When we're obedient and we're trusting that God will help us, we are showing faith in him and it gives us that opportunity to increase our faith. And I just wanna close with saying, it is a choice. So we can choose each day to become like Christ. We can choose each day to accept opportunities to draw closer to him and to our brothers and sisters. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mary Alice, I love that. Just how it's the it's the small things that we do and, and how we interact with each other and looking for the one, like one-on-one -on -one interactions. And, and really at the end of the day, it's our choice. It's the, the way that we choose to show up and the person that we're trying to be. I, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing sharing that. Mary Thank Ellis, you. I loved your story about your daughter. I, I deal with chronic pain and I have friends that deal with chronic pain. And so I, I felt her pain as you described that. What a touching experience. Totally. That, Thank you. Yeah, I loved it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, when she shared that personal experience, I um, I had to grab a tissue. I, I even turned my camera off backstage because I didn't want to see Mark crump my hat. <laughs> it, 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 hit, it hits home it does so thanks for sharing something more you know just very very personal but uh, i think we can all relate to that mary ellis we can all relate to something like that um so I, I really appreciate you being that vulnerable today it was very very good for me thank you definitely thank you so much well thank you so much mary ellis for sharing your testimony and your thoughts and and like chad's and uh, andy said just the personal stories that really hit hit this topic home. So thank you so much for, for being willing to share those things today. Thank you. It really gave me the opportunity to really dwell and think about what it means to become like Christ. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and introduce and bring on our final speaker, our final speaker. I'm sure you can guess who that might be. Chad, what, what is it like to travel 300,000 miles in a year? That just is, that, you know, that seems like a lot. Um, <laughs> For me, it's been um, it's been freedom. I um, and that's a great question. I, 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 you know, people I hear people complain about travel a lot, and for me, it's um, 
I know when we when we get married, we say for better or for worse, and and we we don't plan on certain things happening in our life. And uh, and so for me, it's been a it's been freedom in that the woman that I'm in love with that I've been married to for 26 years, I I um I I, I the truth is I'm not independent. That's why tonight is so special for me in that uh, I'm a big fan of Turtle House and the founders of Turtle House. I know them very, very well. And, and, and uh, Megan, uh, it's, it's not a secret that the Megan is a quadriplegic and she's, uh, and so, and, and wit and they're married and they have two beautiful children. And so it's, it's, we don't plan on our spouse helping us with, you know, whether it's cutting, cutting up steak on a meal or helping shower or getting dressed. And, and, and those things I can do by myself. I'm on the road, but, my wife doesn't like me to do that because it takes two hours and she'd rather have me do, she would rather have me come to come follow me with the kids. Can you believe that? <laughs> so she would rather have me go do scripture study with the kids and allow me my independence to get dressed. And so uh, <laughs> no, that, for me, travel is freedom. It is freedom. And I hope, I hope that that comes across um, the way that I mean it to. Totally. Totally. I, I followed you for a while and, uh, and, before I started traveling with with Meg Johnson and John, by the way, and Hank Smith, I uh, I'd never traveled with somebody in a wheelchair, and so it was cool to. Uh, you post a lot on Instagram about what your experience when you're traveling is like, and so that that was really cool for for me to see your perspective, and I can totally see how how it would be freedom for you. So I I know you've got a lot of things that you want to share, so I don't want to take up uh, any more time. I could oh, talk to you for a long time, so go ahead and take it away. Stay muted, so we make sure we come across. Cross clear and again, uh, welcome tonight. Can I just ask a favor of all of you that are watching? Um, please feel free to chime in the chat box, we can see and respond back. And I uh, ch chime in and, and let us know where you're coming from. Um, let's give um, kudos out to Turtle House as well. And again, as it was mentioned earlier, what, what topics you're looking for next? I, I'm a big fan of Turtle House, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the founders. And as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, I am uh, I've always thought to myself and, and Comparison is the advocate of the adversary. So, but I've always compared myself to to to, to, to Megan um, because I've always thought, you know what? There's no way I'll ever be able to be on Turtle House because they already have, uh, you know, somebody that can share some of those experiences. Because Megan's paralyzed, and Megan became injured a few years after I did, and so it um it it's been good to get to 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 know her. But I always wonder if I'd be able to do this. I'm honored to be able to do this. I'd love to see your comments in the chat box and on. And, and, and so on Sunday night tonight, we'll be able to respond back and, and communicate with you. But please feel free to jot down questions you might have for, for Mel or for Mary Ellis or for Andy, um, uh, President Horn. I'll call him because he's been a state president and, and put that in the chat box. We'd love, we'd love to hear from you. And with that said, I, um, I've been thinking a lot about what to share with you tonight uh, as it pertains to becoming like Christ. And uh, in my preparations, I, I thought of no better place to go. Well, then, from when I when I woke up, I don't want to talk about the accident. Um, I don't want to talk, talk about uh, you know what, what happened to me. What I do want to talk about is what took place afterwards when I was introduced to an apostle, um, and the apostle came to me. Um, I met Elder Maxwell prior to my accident in Bangkok, Thailand. So I met Elder Maxwell in Thailand when I was a missionary there. He came. Over there to set up the first date, and then he came and visited with me in the hospital because my mission president had let him know about my accident. Again, I'm not here to talk about the accident or my paralysis. I just want you to know that that the apostle, Elder Maxwell, he gave me a blessing, and then that blessing, he told me a couple of things. And here's what he told me: he told me that he wanted me to be a better father, he wanted me to be a better husband, he asked me to be a better contributor to my society. And he asked me to be a better disciple. And so I am, um, again, if I have problems with sound, I'm just going to ask Mark or even Whit or somebody to unmute. And I think that that'll clear it up. Um, but he asked me hey, to be Chad. a better disciple. And I didn't think that that was so. Yeah. Hey, Chad, the, the mic is, it's not working right. So I'm just going to hang in here with you. So it'll be like we're talking with each other. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. So, so it should be sound better now, right? With you hanging in yep, with me. Yep, exactly. Yep. It's sounding so, crystal clear about. now. So go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah hang with me. That'd be great. Yeah. That that would be awesome. And hopefully that'll clear that up. So I don't mind that at all. I, I think it's great. 
I always uh, do better with my companion right by my side anyway. So be my <laughs> companion for right now. Perfect. That's so, great. Mu that, much better. I, I think the sound's coming across better. So I apologize for that. So with that said, um, I just want to share with our, our, our listeners tonight, Elder Maxwell comes in and he gives me a picture. And this would be good for you and I, Mark, to kind of quote. I, I want to show them the picture that he gave me. So this is somebody that I consider to know Christ. In fact, we just got off of a general conference where Elder Holland was the concluding apostle right before President Nelson came on. And do you remember what Elder Holland said? He said, similar to what we heard from Mary Ellis tonight and what we heard from uh, uh, Andy as well, that, that we've, we all go through challenges. But how would you feel to be in Christ's presence at the end of our day when we, when we go to the judgment seat? And have a have an have a free life or a life without at, without adversity and be in His presence. It wouldn't. How, how can you become Christ-like if we don't have adversity? Elder Maxwell says it this way: One can't be refined without enduring a little bit of heat. And I loved what Elder Holland said as he closed out conference for us this last this last general conference when he said that how would it be for each one of us to be in Christ's presence without us knowing to some extent of what he experienced. And we all go through that in some form or another, as we've heard from our other speakers tonight. So let's go back to Elder Maxwell. And I want you to see this. Mark, this is unreal. He gives me this picture. And I want, I want the audience to see this. This is unbelievable. This is so cool. So he gives me a picture as a gift. I'm pulling it up on my screen on my end. And this is the picture that I was given. So I want to give some detail. I just pulled it up on the screen. There it is for all of our viewers to see. Look at that picture close. Look at that. So again, we got to keep me unmuted. So we, um, or Mark, you're going to want to stay unmuted, but look at that That's picture. Awesome. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yep. So perfect. So you're unmuted and you can, so it is awesome. And you can see there's a little bit of a, some verbiage down beneath. And this is what Elder Maxwell told me. Now I need our listeners to listen very carefully. Elder Maxwell told me that that picture was drawn by a member of the church. His name is Wendell Johnson. It's what it says in the white script down beneath. So Wendell Johnson is the, is the artist of that picture. And Elder Maxwell gave that to me, telling me that it has been hanging in his office for years, and that that picture was drawn by a man with no arms and no legs. Now, Mark, I'm assuming you're still with me on the call. You can yeah, I'm still, I'm still here. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, can you and I chat? I, I think this would be good to go back and forth for a minute. Yeah, for sure. And I totally. just want to ask you a, a, a question. As yeah. I show you that picture again, Mark, check this out. How do you suppose that a man with no arms and no legs can draw a picture like that where Elder Maxwell in the hospital told me verbatim that that is the closest depiction of the Savior that he has ever seen in his life? Because you can't find that picture at Desert Book. Right. You can't find that picture at Siegel Book and Tape. It's, it's not there. But Elder wow. Maxwell calls that picture, who knows Christ, I believe, with my faith, as well as anybody else on earth, as I believe the apostles and the prophets know Christ. So how is a man that's not a prophet or an apostle by title or decree able to, as we've listened to our other two speakers tonight, describe how to, how is he able to come up with a depiction that an apostle, Elder Maxwell, calls the closest depiction of the Savior? Does, do, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is just having spent time with them, you know, studying the scriptures and, and in prayer and, and pondering and, and, and obviously asking for answers to prayers and stuff like that. I think the same things that we've heard tonight from our other two speakers that have set the tone for this. I, I think you're spot on. Um, and I want to transition this into, into how it's kind of happened with me in my life, but, but, but not with my circumstance. Uh -huh. My wife went to Ethiopia on a mission trip just to do some service a few years back. And while my wife was there, she heard a noise in a, in a brick building, as she describes it. Um, it was not a noise of cheer or laughter, but it was a noise of, of, um, of, of, of tears, a noise of crying. And the brick building was uh, an outhouse, um, a bathroom in, in kind of a, a small village um, that was next door to an orphanage. 
And so my wife decided to walk over to that outhouse. And as she walked over to it, it got louder and louder. And the noise was coming from the men's part of the restroom. My wife walked into that, uh, that room. And what she witnessed was absolutely unreal. She saw a little boy hiding behind what we would call a, 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 a toilet, I guess. Um, my wife called it something. Uh, it's different than the toilets we have here, but, but none of that's important. All you need to know that there was a little, beautiful, dark-skinned boy hiding behind a toilet. Soiled floor, dirty floor, and a kid hiding behind there. My wife doesn't know what to say because obviously she doesn't speak Amharic, which is the Ethiopian language, and not sure if this little kid speaks English. So let's talk about becoming like Christ. This is unreal. My wife simply gets on her knees on the soiled floor, bathroom floor, third world country, and she tries to communicate to no avail. The kid's not coming out. He's staying behind. And so my wife does what this artist does. She starts to draw, but she's not quite as talented as, the, as, as Wendell Johnson as far as artistry goes. So my wife draws a stick figure and she just draws a smiley face with a circle. And, and, and she sticks that paper, according to Shondell's journal, she sticks the paper behind the toilet so that the young kid can see it. The kid takes the pen off the paper re and draws on it and returns it back only this time on his stick figure with a smiley face, it's got a circle on the top. And so he returns that back around. So they're communicating just by way of drawing. It is unbelievable. My wife then colors in a heart where the heart goes on a stick figure in red and returns it back to him. And then he comes out and gives her a hug. And that's when my wife sees it. Huh? He drew a circle because he had a, a double clef on the left side. So that's both teeth sticking out, open clef, and, uh, and, and my wife is just, her heart was pierced. As much as we heard from Mary Ellis tonight about her heart being pierced with her child. Uh -huh. That's what I thought of. In fact, that's what led me to talk about tonight, what we're talking about now, because I had something else planned, but Mary Ellis just screwed up my whole entire thought process. And so we're just going to kind of go with this tonight. Um, my wife was determined to bring him home because he was in an orphanage. Took her 11 months. You guys, 11 months. Don't get me started on that because I, I, I don't get that. Uh, but, but, but we got him. We got him across the Atlantic. And um, I wanted to show you a video of when my wife and my daughter went to pick him up and how that all transpired. Keep in mind, we don't begin to know Christ until perhaps we lose something, if not lose everything. Look at the apostles and what they had to sacrifice. Look at some of the greatest disciples that ever lived. Look at Elder Maxwell. What did he lose? Well, he lost his health. He lost his ability to travel the world. When he came to see me, he had no hair. He had leukemia. And even he questioned our Father in Heaven. One can't begin to become like Christ until perhaps we lose something. As Elder Holland pointed to, how would you feel entering Christ's home, his, his mansion, his fortitude, and not having any challenges or tragedies in life? We wouldn't fit in. So it helps us to embrace those challenges with the lessons that we were taught today. I want you to see the live video footage, which I don't share very often. In fact, I don't think I'd ever shared it in a fireside prior to tonight. And I... Um, I was, uh, I felt the impression after hearing Mary Ellis and, and President Horton speak that I wanted to share it with you tonight. So here it is. This is absolutely unbelievable. This is when Shondell first picks him up. Watch out, Mom. Look at the embrace. They don't even speak the same language. But it's been 11 months. Language is not a barrier to becoming Christ-like. The translator is right there. Look at all the kids that are just looking for love. Looking for, look at them. Look at them. My wife is very Christ-like. They're all kind of coming to her. 
just like we will all flock to Christ. He speaks no English, as I mentioned. They spend two months in Ethiopia to fill out paperwork. My daughter went with my wife to pick him up. There's the nuns. God bless those nuns that help take care of him. And now she's taking him to the hotel where they got to wait for two months. Look at Shondell. That's how you feel when you have Christ-like love. I mean, you just can't help but, but weep. Like I did when Mary shared that story today. I lost it. Just above the Ethiopian capital. That's the person that took care of Caleb for months. Still in Ethiopia. And then, remember, they don't speak the same language. And they're making that bond. And then here's Salt Lake City Airport when we first got to see him. Watch what happens here. Watch. No hesitation. Watch what this little boy does. He shares abundance because abundance compounds. I've never met him before. He hasn't met me. And he runs to my wheelchair based on pictures that he sees. Let's see in the past. Look at this. I've never even met him. And I'm thinking about what I've been taught by Elder Maxwell and Elder Holland. It's first day of school, and I want to stop it right there because I want to end it with something powerful. In the next two months, as he began to capitalize on the losses of his life, he got his mouth fixed. Um, over in Ethiopia and here with Primary Children's Hospital. And he made the choice to become baptized. And the best part about that is he was sealed and baptized by the same, by the same person um, in the temple, in the Salt Lake Temple. We, we got permission to do this on this in the same day. And I have a picture of this. He took the discussions here in Utah with Ethiopian missionaries that spoke his language. And the best part about that picture is this, my oldest son was struggling on whether or not he should go on a mission. I got a picture right here, here it is, there it is. So that's the Salt Lake Temple. He was baptized and sealed the same day by his oldest brother. And my son was debating on whether or not to go on a mission or go play basketball first. Uh, and that day in the temple, President Samuelson, all he did was ask my son to say the opening prayer before Caleb went to be baptized. And after my son said the prayer, so that kid right there, the tall one on the right, after he said the prayer, all Elder Samuelson said was this. So President Cecil Samuelson, who was the president of the Salt Lake Temple, said, I can tell by your prayer that you know Christ, that you know Christ more than most your age. So he's saying this to my son, my, my, my oldest boy. He said, I need you to escort your father and your younger brother to places in the temple today that are very sacred, that only most that only endowed people are allowed to go to. And after my son had that experience, something happened to him where he felt like he was closer to the Savior than ever before. Whereupon when we left the temple that day, he had made his decision to go on a mission to serve, and he got his calling to serve in Micronesia, Guam, which is an, uh, a, a a mission that uh, encompasses 13 islands similar to, Samo well, we got Samoa, you got Saipan, you got Pompeii, Chuuk. That's the Micronesia Guam mission. All because he lost something, just like Elder Holland taught, Elder Maxwell taught, all because he followed what we've been taught by Andy and Mary today. And our family today is, well, we're all back together. Here's our latest family photo. Here's the two boys. One boy returned back from Australia. The other boy returned back honorably from Micronesia. There's Gracie right there. There's Caleb in the back. And there's Shondell. We just celebrated 26 years. And we're on the ranch, which is our dream. 
And the last thing I'll share with you is this. You want to talk about becoming like Christ? You want to talk about knowing what it looks like? There it is right there. No, look at him. Look at him. If you think that he's wearing church clothes because it's Sunday, you're wrong. If you think it's photo day at school, you're wrong. Why is my son wearing church clothes? Well, he wears them every day. I know it's a little odd, a little different. He goes to public school, not private, and he wears a shirt and tie every day to school because his dream is to go be Christ-like and serve other people the way that he was served when he got his mouth fixed. My son's dream is to do his missionary and, and discipleship by helping other people get their mouth fixed like he got his mouth fixed. I guess I'll end with my testimony in the form of a question. Do you have the same ability as my son? To be willing to lose everything in order to gain everything. That kid was willing to sacrifice everything in order to one day he will be a surgeon. I can tell, right? I mean, he's in sixth grade. He's already taking college courses on the anatomy of the body and the face. He's brilliant. And whenever I see him, and I see him a lot now because I'm not traveling as much with the pandemic, I want to be like him. I want to have that kind of heart. I want to have that kind of a, well, the humility, the patience that we've heard about today. I want to have, I want to have that kind of, closeness to my savior so i can become like him remember you can only become like those that you hang around the most maybe that's why that gentleman wendell johnson was able to draw that picture he knew the savior because he hung around him by way of prayer sacrifice study um, fasting showing the savior and the savior allowed him to become friends with him to know him maybe that's why he was able to draw what an apostle called the closest depiction of the savior I would like to have that in my life as well. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Chad, <clears throat> your your message really hit home for me today. Just the the image that came to my mind while you were speaking, you might have seen this this picture before this meme where there's the, a picture of the Savior and he's holding a teddy bear behind his back and uh, the girl in front of him or the, the, the kid in front of him is just so sad because because of whatever reason, it's just like, just, just come uh, the, at least the idea is like, come to me. I've got something so much better just waiting for you behind me, you know? And, uh, and I just, I loved your message. Thank you so much for sharing your, your testimony today. And I apologize for the sound. Thanks for unmuting Mark. Thanks for joining me. It made it better. I, I we'll, we'll figure that out here for the next week, but I, I appreciate you doing that. It's all good. That really stood out to me was your, your wife's closeness to the savior is what saved your son. And that's powerful. And I could just see the love in her eyes in that picture and in that video. Yeah, when they're, when they're car, I mean, it hits her like, yeah. like maybe Mary Magdalene and she couldn't leave, right? And my wife could leave. That's how I, I picture it. You're, you're right. I, I'm not comparing my wife to Mary Magdalene per se, but, but when you feel that close to the Savior, how can you not weep? Yeah. How can you not weep for joy? I mean, I, I, so... Yeah, I'm powerful. striving for that, Mary. Mary I, I'm striving for that. You know, being being home now and now being around. I'm learning how to be married all over again. We've been together for 26 years, and I'm I'm learning how to <laughs> be like that because my uh, scapegoat go, drug of choice has been a hotel room for 20 years. That's been my <laughs> that's been my, my go to, right? Uh, so anyway, Chad, could I ask you a question about something you said? Um, you made the statement, "We don't become." To know Jesus, we don't become, let's see, we don't become like Jesus Christ until we lose something or don't become to know him till we lose something. Do I attribute that quote to you? Did you hear that somewhere? It's very profound for me. Yeah. I, I haven't heard it anywhere, but I'm sure somebody has said something similar. I just, I, I, I feel like as I've watched Meg Johnson and her losses and what she, and what she, her videos that she posts and how happy she is, she talks a lot about that. Um, and, and the people that I know to be the most Christ like they've lost something, whether it be a child, uh, challenges with their own health, you being a state president, you've dealt with kids that have lost their, their faith, their hope. We have a lot of people right now in our world that are going through fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Those are all losses. 
But yeah, look what's happening to people's closeness to their savior. We have never had a greater attendance at a conference between members and non-members alike. Something's happening right now. God's ha I, I can't put my finger on it, but something's happening right now because of the losses that we're going through. So again, you don't yeah. have to be paralyzed physically to go through a loss. I think we've heard that today from, from you know, our speakers. Um, but I, I do believe that we have to experience loss in order to become like him in order to understand him better. Hence the guy that didn't have any arms and legs that drew that picture with his mouth. I mean, he, he used his mouth and he knew what he was drawn. Andy, that's the only way I can explain it. I don't even I don't even speak well with my mouth, let alone draw with it. So that is <laughs> <laughs> and that was amazing. Yeah, yeah it was. And uh, I'm still trying to to fathom this journey you made to Las Vegas in a wheelchair. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You're not going to go back to that. <laughs> well, we'll have to we'll have to to talk about that. So typically, what we do after the firesides is we we just kind of chat for a few minutes. So why don't we close things up here and then yeah, Chad, you got to talk a little bit about that uh, that journey. So <laughs> so well, thank you all who are watching at home from around the world. Let let us know in the comments where you're from. We'd love to see where you're from and where you're tuning in from. And so thank you so much for participating in tonight's Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. I know I've felt uplifted and, and edified, and we hope that, that you, wherever you are around the world, have felt the same way as well. We're going to have a closing prayer by Chad, actually. So, Chad, would you mind offering that for us? Sure, not a problem. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this Sabbath day grateful for the inspiration, the thoughts that have gone into the preparation for tonight's talks. We're grateful for... Mary Ellis and for Andy uh, uh, being willing to give of their time, their talents and their knowledge and, and share with all of us. We are especially grateful for those that have chosen to listen to uh, tonight's uh, fireside and, and to glean from that. We pray on behalf of those that they will take this, these messages and, and whatever else they've heard and that they will follow the example that we've heard in the New Testament about not hiding under a bushel, but letting their light shine that that their works might glorify the, um, based on the impressions that they've had. We are also grateful for those that have put this fireside together, working behind the scenes and have uh, gone forth with impressions they've had to, to create this kind of a platform where we can enjoy these firesides in a time where they are needed. Father, these things we pray for and we show our gratitude to thee before we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Well, thank you all for uh, for being with us again, for taking your time tonight to to share your thoughts and your testimonies. I, it's just been it's just been awesome being with you. So thank you, thank you, Chad, thank you, Andy, thank you, Mary Alice, for for being with us tonight. So let's let's hang out. And we can chat for a few minutes, and anybody who's watching can hang along with us. But uh, but I think Andy kicked it off the right way. Chad, you got to tell us. So. So uh, Carmen Herbert does the Doing Good po podcast, and she just recently interviewed you, Chad. So I, I heard a little bit about your story. And for those of you who are who are listening in, th there's an episode with Chad coming out uh, here in the next few weeks that where he talks a little bit about this story. But I'd love to hear you tell it. Hear you tell it. <laughs> I don't know if I'll tell the whole story just because I don't want to take up time, but I'll show a couple of photographs. Just I wasn't planning on this um, again. Like Mary Alice did, she screwed up my whole message today because I wasn't planning on <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, no, I apologize. I know, I know you guys are saying, just, I, I want to pull up a couple of photographs for this so you can kind of, so check this out. This is kind of, this is, so I, I, I did this because I wanted to do something a little bit different. There's a kind of a, there's a picture right there. So that, we, we, we trained for 18 months at, and look close at that. Um, I think there's some great parables and analogies that relate to the gospel. So I'm right there with a the white hat. There's my dad with his motorcycle hat because he's certainly not going to run to Vegas. And so he's going to be on a motorcycle. Thanks for making that a little bigger, Mark. And there's Shondell. And, you know, there was about 3,000 people there at Temple Square to send me off. And um, ABC4 is there. 
NBC uh, in Utah, CBS and Fox. There's a lot of people that are there. And the reason why I bring that up is because I think that when, that's why we have to go to church. We need to be in touch with Christ. I think that we, we feel this renewal. We get, we get motivated. We watch this fireside tonight on the Sabbath day. We feel this energy, enthusiasm, ambition, um, perseverance, um, patience, as, as was talked about tonight. We're, the humility that we need to be more like Christ. But then throughout the week, as like the marathon, there's a lot of space in between. I mean, Salt Lake and Vegas, there's a lot of empty space. And I'll just get, I'll just jump right to it. Um, have you ever felt like giving up? Have you ever felt like, you know, this is just too much. I just don't, I just don't know if I can take another school closure. I just don't know if I can take another canceled soccer game or football game. I just don't know if I can wear a mask. I mean, this is just, this is just too much. Have you ever felt like that before in your life? Um, sure. Yeah. Every day. I was going to say all the time. Last, last in the pandemic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt like that on the marathon. And I wanted to share one quick point and we'll be done. And then we can share that story another time, Mark. And we can do that. That'll Sounds give, good, yeah. uh, maybe that's kind of a little promo for me to, to kind of behind the scenes to Whit and Meg to get me. I want to come back on the Turtle House. I love the Turtle House. I'm just a fan. But, but, but I will share this. If you've seen the movie Forrest Gump, you remember he, he just he just stops. And he says, I think I'll go home now. I mean, do you remember seeing that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. From the Pacific to the Atlantic, and then from the northern border to the southern border. And then he just, all of a sudden, just, I don't know where he just stops. And he says, I think I'll go home now. I did that same thing before I completed the race. I was in Mesquite, Nevada, and I, um, I was tired. I had had enough. I was worn out. I was beat up. I mean, sometimes... Even death seems like a better option than some of the things that we go through in this life. Um, so I decided to give up and stop. So I stopped right in the middle of the highway, whereupon my father came out from the motorhome behind. The police car stopped in front. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. And my dad says, is everything all right? And I said, well, I think I'll go home now. And uh, you know, I I'm done. And then my dad asked me a very profound question. He said, son, how have you been measuring your progress? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't understand your question. So I, I, he said, how have you been measuring your success on this journey to Las Vegas? I said, well, I, I'm counting. He said, what are you counting? I said, well, I'm just counting the, yeah, the, the, green, the green, the mile markers, the numbers, so I know how close I am. He said, well, that's not a bad way to measure, but I'm not sure that Heavenly Father measures metrically, like how many years were you a state president? He's probably not going to ask you that, son. How many years did you serve in a bishop? Or how many years were you a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? God is not overly overwhelmed with statistics, and you shouldn't be either. But if you want to count, he said, why don't you start counting the yellow stripes in the middle of the road? And it sounded really stupid to me to do that. He, my dad wanted me to count the yellow stripes, which sounded stupid. So reluctantly, reluctantly, I agreed. They carried me back out of the motorhome, and I got back on the wheelchair, and I just I stayed away from the green signs, and I started looking at the stripes. And that night, I pushed just over a couple thousand stripes. Day number nine, I pushed 8,000 stripes. And day number 10, I pushed just over 10,600 stripes, and that's when I hit Apex Junction. For those of you that don't know where Apex Junction is, it's only 17 miles away from my goal, and it's all downhill from there. I mean, it's downhill. So we waited until 9 o'clock on day 11. They shut down the strip, full police entourage, all on motorcycles. There was a helicopter above us, and I coasted my way into the Mirage, and it was unbelievable. I mean, people were running out of the the, wow. the casinos cheering me on now oh, granted God. they were all drunk but i didn't care i mean it made me think about my thing. and many people have sent me off welcomed me and when i crossed when i crossed the finish line i have a picture i, I again please forgive me because i wasn't prepared to share but I, i'd like to share it if i can yeah I, yeah um, when i when i crossed it there it is there's the yellow stripes. Let's just, let's just do this photograph. 
There's the yellow stripes right there. I'm just right in the middle. I'm counting on a frontage road. And when I cross that finish line, there went up a cheer from a bunch of drunk people and non-drunk people alike that made me weep. Oh, and it made me, it made me think of what my dad and what I believe Heavenly Father also believes that it's not by one big grand event that we're saved. We're not saved because of Christ's atonement. We're not. We have to work. We have to get dirty. We have to. We have. There's calluses on my hands. Um, Jesus Christ had holes in his. Nobody wants hands like that. But I think God is not going to ask us about our callings in our church, what religion we were. I, I do think he's going to want to look at our hands, and I think he's looking for the closest hands that resemble that of his sons. And we don't have to stick nails through our wrists or our hands to do that. And so that's that's what I learned from the marathon. That's I think I've taken too much. So I, I like the power I, of the mindset shift where your dad introduced a different way to look at it and the power that that had on you. That is incredible that instead of looking at the markers, you were looking at the yellow lines and then that gave you the motivation to keep going and to finish the race when you were totally defeated when he said that. It's incredible. I love that. And mindset yeah. is big today, right? I mean, it's, it's huge today in today's world for yeah. our, our high school students, for adults that have lost their job, now doing homeschool with their kids. It's, yeah. you have to shift the mindset. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. It's powerful. All right. That's awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chad. One more statement you made. Language is, isn't a barrier to being Christ-like. What a profound sentence for what we're going through in the world right now. Language, skin color, uh, background. Yeah, what a great statement. So thanks for it. Uh, yeah, everyone had great comments. And you two married amazing women, but you two are also amazing men. <laughs> 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 well, my wife's name is Stephanie. I always say, though, she's one step ahead of me. And that never That's about as good of a dad joke as it gets. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you're welcome. <laughs> so, so question for you, Andy. How, how have things uh, changed with the teaching institute and everything uh, with COVID and the pandemic and stuff like that? What I mean, are you, is everything online or are you able to teach in person a little bit or how did, how does that all work this year for you? So half my classes, half of our classes are face to face with masks and the other half are on Zoom. And to be quite honest, I don't have the same hatred for Zoom most people have. I have seen some great <laughs> benefits come from it. Mm -hmm. It's actually really hard to teach face to face with a mask on because when you, you know how it is when you get talking, you need air and you can't get air. So I'm constantly pulling my mask out of my chin so I can breathe while I teach. And, but I will testify of this. The spirit teaches the same way, regardless of the interface. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I teach five face-to-face, -face, two Zoom, uh, three Zoom, and then it, it's it's amazing. Hopefully we get to keep going. Utah yeah. is not, not helping us. so. <laughs> yeah, things are a little crazy right now. Hope everybody's staying safe. Yeah. So. That's awesome. And I Mary know. Alice, I still can't get over that view. Oh, I know. <laughs> I'm going to go enjoy it after this. <laughs> it's nothing what? like living in a cold, like subarctic temperature like Boston for 17 years to make you appreciate good weather, I'm telling you. No so. joke. What are what are some of your favorite your your family's favorite things to do down there at the beach? Uh, we're big pickleball players, actually. I know that was big in Utah, but it's gotten huge in California. And I got my kids. I have to say, this whole quarantine thing, I was a little nervous about close proximity. The kids come home from college. We're all in the house 24-7. That scared me a little bit. But it ended up being great. You know, we started learning things together and cooking together and having three meals a day together. And my daughter just went back to Utah. And I was like, practically chasing the moving <laughs> truck when she went back. I'm like, oh, no, I miss you. I love it. It's fun. It's the nice thing about living here is we're so close to our kids that are in Utah. So, you know, it's like an hour and a half flight. It's so easy or a 10 hour drive. So we get to see our family all the time. There's so many good benefits to that. Oh, we should just move. 
I know. Utah's great. My husband won't I tried to give to Midway. <laughs> oh. Having it. Midway is amazing. I would I would have no problem living in Midway at all. That's it's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, so pretty. No, but we love it. We're in Utah a lot. And my son's a big surfer. So we came out here for him to have more friends in the church and for him to surf. And so, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a good life here. And you're all welcome to visit anytime. If you're ever speaking here, <laughs> we have a guest house in the backyard. You're welcome to stay in. Oh, hey, there's awesome. good waves. There's good waves down at Utah Lake. Tell your son to come give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> he can't oh, drown. Yeah, he might be blowing when he gets out of the water. That's, yeah, that's true. Right. That's true. It's a natural phenomenon created by the carp or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> so he has <laughs> <laughs> when he comes out. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, well, thank you guys again. Thank you all again for being here with us and participating in tonight's Archer House Digital Fireside. You, the talks that you've given have been amazing. And I'm, I'm sure that all those who are listening around the world have just been uplifted and edified and, and f feel spiritually strengthened because of the messages that you've shared. So thank you so much. And for all of you that are listening at home, if you haven't already, go to turtles.link slash app and download the free Archer House app. Again, that, uh, it's, it's just a little turtle. You can, so it's really easy to find. The content's free. Can, there's all these digital firesides that uh, that we've done this year are totally free, as well as as a bunch of other content. And then if you'd like to upgrade, you can do that as well. And otherwise, go to turtle.link slash share and share your thoughts, your feedback. And if you've got ideas for future speakers or or topics that you'd like to hear on these firesides, please send them our way. We'd love to hear them. And, and just like you saw at the beginning of tonight's fireside, we pull experiences from you and ideas from you every single week. So thank you so much. And with that, we'll we'll say goodbye until next week when we'll have another Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. So thank you again for